The human papilloma virus, or HPV, may have a reputation as being a young person's disease, but it does not discriminate. Besides being the most common sexually transmitted infection in the world, it's also one of the most feared, as the mounting evidence points towards cancers of the cervix, throat, anus, and penis. Fortunately, scientists have developed a vaccine that protects both men and women against some of the most dangerous strains of HPV. For maximum protection, you should get the vaccine before becoming sexually active, ideally around the age of 11 or 12. However, vaccination is still recommended by the FDA and typically covered by insurance for anyone up to age 26. But what if you're older than 26? Can you and should you still consider getting vaccinated? For women, the newest evidence suggests that all HPV vaccines are effective in preventing cervical cancer for up to 45 years of age. For men, the HPV vaccine was first made available in 2009. These days, regardless of gender, the 26 and over demographic can indeed get vaccinated. Though hard to measure, it can be worthwhile, and here's why. Regardless of age, you'll probably still get at least a little protection. The current version of the HPV vaccine covers nine different strains of the virus. The odds of having been exposed to every single one of these strains is low, even among people who have had several sexual partners. Obviously, the fewer partners you've had, the more you stand to gain in terms of protection. However, the average person is likely to experience at least a small protective benefit. It's worth considering even if you're in a loving relationship. You and your current partner might be monogamous, but this doesn't necessarily mean that you should forego the HPV vaccine. Relationships may not last forever and significant others have been known to cheat. It's safe to get regardless of age. When getting any vaccine, there's always a risk of side effects. However, most of them are mild and temporary. This is true of the HPV vaccine too. It doesn't pose greater risk than other vaccines, and it certainly doesn't cause mental retardation as a conservative congresswoman erroneously claimed in 2011. Also, if you've already been infected with HPV, this vaccine won't hurt you. The reason this vaccine is only recommended for people under 26 has nothing to do with safety. In fact, we know it's safe for older folks because in some countries, including Australia, this vaccine is recommended for use up to age 45. It's not cheap. Most insurance companies won't cover the cost of the HPV vaccine if you're over the recommended age. Unfortunately, this means a significant out-of-pocket expense as a series of three shots cost $150 to $200 each. That's up to $600, which might hurt more than the shots themselves. Consider shopping around. If your Planned Parenthood defers, try going to a clinic at a local drugstore where they're more apt to go off-label. The price tag of this vaccine is why it's only covered by insurance for people under 26. Why is that? Well, it's just not economically feasible to give a $600 vaccine to everybody. Thus, federal regulators establish guidelines that prioritize protecting those at the highest risk of infection. Such recommendations are designed to maximize public health at minimal cost. They aren't necessarily in the best interest of each individual, like you, the listener. Despite the hassle and expense, it is safe and efficacious for older adults to get the HPV vaccination. Though there's no real way to know exactly how much protection any vaccine provides, we do know it's now a viable option worth exploring and perhaps giving a shot. Thus far, the focus has been on older Americans. The rest of this HPV photo play will apply to all ages and concentrate on the best lines of defense, preventative vaccinations and proactive community health workers. The four objectives for this HPV specific session are to describe the potential impact of the human papillomavirus and the science behind it, to understand the survival rate curve and its impact on human societies and families, to recognize the need for an HPV vaccine that is medically efficacious and locally available, and finally, to acknowledge the vital role of the IPE and how its cadres of community health workers play a vital role in promoting vaccine use. As far as vital signs, HPV, or human papillomavirus, is the most common sexually transmitted infection today. HPV is not the same as herpes or HIV, 
The HPV virus has well over 100 different varieties. So-called low-risk types are not associated with any cancer. They may not even cause symptoms. However, they may cause genital warts or non-cancerous changes on the cervix. High-risk types do not cause warts or other symptoms, but they can cause cell changes in the cervix that can later become cancer. High-risk types of HPV are also linked to cancer of the vulva in women, cancer of the penis in men, plus cancer of the oropharynx and anus in both men and women. When it comes to diagnosing HPV, experienced clinicians might be able to determine HPV infection by looking at your warts. If genital warts are not visible, you'll need one or more of the following tests, starting with the vinegar or acetic acid solution test. A vinegar compound is applied to HPV infected genital areas and potentially turns them white. This may help in identifying difficult to see flat lesions. With the PAP test, your doctor collects a small sample of cells from your cervix or vagina to send for laboratory analysis. PAP tests can reveal abnormalities that can lead to cancer. Concluding with the DNA test, this check conducted on the cells from your cervix can recognize the DNA of high-risk varieties of HPV that have been linked to genital cancers. This exam is recommended for women 30 and older in addition to the PAP test. When politicians or celebrities raise unscientific false claims about vaccines, vaccination rates can drop. Such negative press can and does set the cause back. Past vaccine scares have led to new outbreaks of diseases that had previously been under control, like measles and whooping cough. With HPV, there may be emerging treatments for wart growth and cell changes, but unfortunately, these do not affect the virus itself. The bottom line is, because HPV does not respond to antibiotic therapies, there is no current cure for HPV. For patients under our care, that leads prevention and treatment. It also brings us to the vital human issue of survival rates once HPV detection occurs. This simple bar chart helps to show why prevention of an early detection is so important. A five-year survival rate refers to the percentage of people diagnosed with cancer who will be alive five years answer their diagnosis. If women are diagnosed early and the cervical cancer is not yet spread beyond the cervix, 92% of them will be alive five years after their diagnosis. If women are diagnosed with cervical cancer at later stages, the five-year survival rate sadly drops to 68% or lower. As you can see, the later the diagnosis, the shorter a patient lives. And unfortunately, South Texas women are most often diagnosed at the more advanced stages of this disease. As far as the heart science behind the human papillomavirus, certain members of our IPE team may be very interested in the microbiology and epidemiology behind HPV. If so, the next two slides are for you. For everyone, please enjoy this short but superb virus summation opus produced by NBC's Today Show. Most parents today have heard about the HPV or human papillomavirus vaccine, but don't know that much about it. And if you don't know much about it, how can you decide if it's right for your son or daughter? Here's what you need to know. HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the US. HPV are a group of over 200 related viruses and while most of them aren't harmful, there are about a dozen so-called high-risk HPVs which can cause cancer. Almost all cases of cervical cancer and about 95% of anal cancers are caused by HPV. The strains that cause genital warts do not cause cancer, but importantly, the strains that are covered by the vaccine are the cancer-causing ones. Most sexually active adults in their 20s have been exposed to HPV, but for most, the infections clear up without causing harm. In other cases, chronic infections of certain types of HPV can cause cancers of the cervix, vulva, vagina, penis, anus, or throat. The Food and Drug Administration has approved two HPV vaccines. They are safe and effective. The HPV vaccine protects females and males from HPV diseases. All girls and boys starting at age 11 or 12 should get two or three doses of the vaccine. If you're older than the recommended age, 
talk to your doctor about whether or not you should get the vaccine. If you haven't had the vaccine, the best way to prevent infection is to use barrier protection, such as condoms. More specifically, our focus today needs to be on education and prevention. To that end, we must promote the use of the readily available vaccines. The Federal Center for Disease Control in Georgia points providers towards Minnesota, where their state health department has created a quartet of persuasive short features, which will now show in rapid succession. I told you, this hockey is just not a good idea. Well. Oh, so that's gonna be sore for a few days, uh, but it should get better by the end of the week. Let us know if it doesn't, okay? All right. Now, uh, I see that you turned 12, so since you're here, this would be a great time for those vaccines which are recommended at this age, which are uh, HPV, Tdap, meningococcal, are there any questions about that? Yeah, the HPV, that seems like something that could wait until she's a little older, don't you think? I think I get your drift, and I know it seems kind of soon, but the thing is, the vaccine are recommended at the youngest age, for which they've been proven safe and effective. No matter what the disease, you want to make sure that immunity is in place before the exposure happens. A bonus is that at Isabella's age, kids respond much more vigorously to the vaccine than older kids and adults, and that might make even better protection. It's also convenient because, well, there are two other vaccines due at the same age, and, uh, well, those two and the first dose of HPV can all be given at the same appointment. Okay, but I just wonder what we might be opening the door to. Okay. Some people have had that worry. And there's research been done that has studied that question and they found no more sexual activity among girls that have had that vaccine compared to those that hadn't. So that may have eased some minds, especially considering what you get in exchange. I think it's pretty amazing that there's a safe and effective way of preventing cancer. I'd feel a lot better if we got her protected today. Okay. Okay, everything looks great, and you can pick up your forms for the soccer tryouts on your way out. I noticed in your chart here that we haven't given you the HPV vaccine, though. Uh, we should do that today. Uh, do you have any questions for me before we bring your mom back in? Well, like we've talked about it, and I'm not having sex. When I do, I won't be the kind of person that's been around a lot. I just don't feel like I need it. Well, it makes me really happy to know that you've made the decision to not have sex for now and see yourself being careful about it in the future. It's going to protect your health in a lot of different ways. The thing that most people don't know about HPV, though, is that it's incredibly common. It turns out that four out of five of us will have at least one HPV infection during our lives. So it's not something that just circulates in people who have a lot of partners. Almost all of us will be exposed to it sooner or later in your case later. The vaccine gets your natural immune processes going, so you're ready and able to fight off an infection if you are exposed in the future. I've never heard anybody I know that has HPV. Well, it's not exactly the kind of thing people talk about. And really, people your age wouldn't have any way to know if they did have HPV. We usually don't test for it until you're an adult. And the cancers that it causes generally don't show up for years. Now, the virus can just come and go without causing any trouble if it's the type that doesn't cause warts or cancer. And even if it is a dangerous type, sometimes the body can clear it before it can do any damage. It's just that there's no way to control which type or types you'll get, and no way to guarantee that if you do get a cancer-causing type, it'll go away on its own. I'd hate for you to count on luck when you can protect yourself by getting vaccinated. If we get the first one done today, you can schedule the next two on your way out and be done in six months. Okay.
Sean, you're in great health. It's wonderful to see you making so many healthy choices. Shannon, everything looks good. The last thing we need to do today is to get you the vaccines that are recommended at this age. Meningococcal, HPV, and Tdap. I know the nurse gave you these vaccine information statements to look at before. Do either of you have any questions about the three vaccines? Well, I'm okay with the meningococcal and the Tdap, but I've heard some bad things about the HPV, so I think we'll just skip that today. Uh, can you say some more about what you've heard? Well, it's a relatively new vaccine, and I've heard that some people have had some pretty bad reactions to it, and I'm just not worried enough about HPV to take a chance that the vaccine's going to do something bad to Sean. I know it's been in the news a lot lately, and actually, because I've had so many questions from my patients about it, I made it a special point to really look into the safety studies behind it. Vaccines go through a lot of testing before they ever get to a doctor's office. These tests make sure that the vaccines work at preventing diseases and that they're very safe. There's also ongoing monitoring for safety all the time that they're being used with the general public. I have a chart on the wall that we can look at that explains the process in more detail, but the HPV vaccine has been recommended and licensed since 2006, and we don't have any serious safety concerns. But I know I've heard about people fainting after getting it. Adults and adolescents sometimes do faint after certain medical procedures, including vaccinations, so it's not specific to the HPV vaccine. In fact, we ask all big kids and adults to stay seated in the office for 15 minutes after every vaccination for that very reason. Now, I'm very comfortable with the safety of the HPV vaccine, and I do think it's important for Sean to have it today. My nieces and nephews went through the same vaccination series when they were Sean's age, and I wouldn't want anything different for him. Well, what do you think? <laughs> okay. All right, Brady, I think the doctor is going to want to do a throat culture on you, so I'll bring back a tray of supplies for that. Also, looking at your chart, it looks like you're due for some vaccines, Tdap, meningococcal, and HPV. We have some vaccine information statements that you'll want to read, but do you have any questions? I hate to see him get three shots at once, and I've read that the HPV uh, vaccination doesn't necessarily prevent all types of HPV, so I think we'll just skip that one. It's true that there are many different types of HPV, so it's great that you're aware of that. We're really happy that the vaccine we use in this office protects against two cancer-causing types of HPV and two types that cause genital warts. We actually had a continuing education service on this and learned that the four types of HPV the vaccine prevents are responsible for, by far, the biggest share of a whole variety of cancers, including anal cancer in men. Plus, they also account for 90% of genital warts. And the vaccine's nearly 100% effective against those four virus types, so it really does knock out a lot of the health threats from HPV. And there's no evidence that the vaccine wears off even years after you've had it. So you'd recommend it pretty strongly then? I do. The pediatricians and the family doctors in our office do. And actually the oncologists here in town, those are the cancer specialists, are big fans of the HPV vaccine. The cancer doctors in particular would love to have fewer patients coming to them who could have avoided cancer if they'd had the HPV vaccine. Oh, well, looks like you're getting that shot. Totally okay with that. And now, this is where it all comes together. Navigating healthcare systems is challenging, especially for patients with a language barrier or other problems understanding what chronic diseases like diabetes, cancer, or heart disease are and how to manage them. Some of us take for granted that everyone understands how to take your medications, how to take a medication list with you to an appointment, if there's preparation for the appointment, and then know how to stay with their treatment plan. Those are the kinds of things that a community health worker actually helps address what we call health literacy. Research has shown that hiring community health workers to be part of comprehensive health care teams helps overcome these and other challenges, leading to better access to care, increased compliance, increased quality of care, and reduced costs. One study estimates that programs like these that reduce the need to see costly specialists could lead to a nationwide cost savings of $60 billion a year. 
A study by Denver Health shows that it saved $2.28 for every $1 invested in the program. A Baltimore program with community health workers showed a 38% drop in emergency room visits and a 30% drop in hospitalizations, leading to a reduction in Medicaid costs of 27%. Because they know the culture, the language, and particular challenges of the communities they serve, community health workers are uniquely suited to build bridges between patients and healthcare professionals. Our community health worker is bilingual. She spends many hours helping them optimize their health. I am the link between the provider and the clients. Before they go to the doctor, they come to me and uh, they ask me questions uh, about uh, their conditions. Most of them don't speak English. I am not a doctor, but I try to help them to understand better their conditions. Community health workers like Emma have varying job titles, including lay health advisor, peer educator, promotora, but have been similarly trained to offer education, informal counseling, and support to patients so that healthcare teams and providers can provide the best possible care. We wish that we had 10 positions like this that we could spread across the county and work with individuals that just need additional support. Ella está al pendiente de qué enfermedad tiene uno, si tiene uno colesterol, tratar de bajárselo. For healthcare providers and patients, hiring one or more community health workers may be the smartest investment a healthcare team can make. That final video made it abundantly clear how important IPE trained community health workers are in the field. Specific to our locality and the topic at hand, community education programs such as Entre Familia are working to promote the use of the HPV vaccine. This bilingual program uses an interprofessional education approach by providing valuable medical training in areas such as HPV to the healthcare specialists at distant and disparate clinical sites. Armed with tailored training, curative resources, and the proper mindset, these interprofessionally educated scholars become community health workers and invaluable members of the rural and urban medical scenes. Remember, human papillomavirus infections may start when you're young, but their consequences last your entire lifespan. Remember how both preteens and teens benefit the most from HPV immunizations. Remember how girls and women 11 through 26 years old ought to receive the HPV vaccine. Remember how boys are at risk too. Vaccinate them between 11 to 21 years old. Remember that the vaccine is more effective if given before a preteen or teen is sexually active. Remember how all women should have pap smears once every three years beginning at the age of 21. And remember how the final takeaway for all IPE scholars and community health workers is that prevention is the best medicine here and that currently comes in the form of readily available papilloma virus vaccinations.